Welcome to the last month at the Federal Circuit, a look at recent Federal Circuit decisions impacting the intellectual property community. Finnegan partner Dr. Amanda Murphy joins us now to offer insight into a recently decided case that involves patent rights of CRISPR technology and the role that standard of review can play in Federal Circuit proceedings. Amanda, before we get into the details of the case, can you offer an overview of what CRISPR is? The term CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, and it refers to DNA segments that were first discovered in bacteria and other single-celled organisms that play a role in protecting those organisms from invading pathogens. The CRISPR systems seek out and destroy invading pathogens by cutting up their genetic material. CRISPR systems do not exist naturally in multi-cell organisms, such as humans, but the systems have been harvested to induce accurate genome editing in organisms ranging from plants to humans. A key component of CRISPR systems is the effector protein, which is also called a CRISPR-associated or Cas protein. The Cas protein acts like a tiny pair of scissors to cleave target DNA. In most CRISPR systems, the Cas protein is directed to the target DNA by a strand of RNA called a guide or CRISPR RNA. Scientists can engineer specific guide RNAs to direct a Cas protein to a specific gene and, for example, cut out mutations that are causing a disease and replace the mutations with normal sequences. CRISPR has already been used in the laboratory to correct genetic defects that cause cystic fibrosis, to extract HIV from infected cells, and to improve the body's response to cancer. Scientists are also developing CRISPR to engineer hardier, more disease-resistant plants. The precision of CRISPR makes it probably one of the most powerful genome editing technologies that have been developed to date. In what areas are we seeing IP disputes related to CRISPR technology? The IP disputes over CRISPR technology span across the globe, but the main patent battlegrounds so far have been in the United States and Europe. The disputes predominantly focus on two academic groups, one based at UC Berkeley and the other at the Broad Institute, which is affiliated with Harvard and MIT. In Europe, both groups were awarded a foundational CRISPR patent, but the European Patent Office subsequently revoked the Broad's patent due to an alleged procedural error that left the patent without a valid priority claim, allowing intervening prior art to invalidate the patent. But as we will see in a bit when we get to the facts of the case we're going to discuss today, the Broad Institute has seen a bit more success in the United States. Tell us about the case. Well, the dispute started out as a question over which of the two groups, the Berkeley group or the Broad group, was the first to invent the use of CRISPR systems that use a particular effector protein called Cas9 for genetic manipulation. In 2012, researchers at Berkeley filed a patent application and published an article demonstrating the use of CRISPR-Cas9 systems to edit genetic material in test tubes and single-celled organisms. Several months later, Broad researchers filed a patent application and published an article demonstrating the use of CRISPR-Cas9 to edit DNA in human cells. Berkeley's application claimed a method of using CRISPR-Cas9 to modify genetic material in any system, from test tubes to single-celled organisms to multi-celled organisms. The Broad's application, on the other hand, only claimed the use of CRISPR-Cas9 for modifying the genomes of multi-celled organisms like humans and plants. The Broad Institute fast-tracked their application and was awarded several patents while the Berkeley application was still pending. When Berkeley became aware of the Broad patents, they asked the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office to declare an interference between its application and the Broad patents to determine which of the groups was the first to invent the use of CRISPR-Cas9 for genome editing. So under the version of the U.S. patent law that applied when the Berkeley and Broad applications were filed, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office was required to issue a patent to the first party to invent the claimed subject matter. And interference proceedings are used to determine which inventor is entitled to a patent when two or more parties claim to have invented the same thing. To make that determination, the Patent Office applies a two-way test and asks whether the invention of one party's claim would be patentable 
over the other party's claim and vice versa. In this case, the Patent Office granted Berkeley's request and initiated an interference investigation between the two groups. The Broad Institute argued that its claims were patentable over Berkeley's claims because genome editing is so unpredictable that people working in the field would not have reasonably expected success in using CRISPR-Cas9 in multicelled organisms based on the test tube and single-celled organism experiments described in Berkeley's application. The Patent Office ended up agreeing with the Broad Institute and determined that no interference actually existed between the two parties. According to the Patent Office, the Broad's claims, which are limited to using CRISPR-Cas9 in multicelled organisms, are separately patentable over Berkeley's claims, which do not specify any particular cell type. As a result, the Patent Office ended up not having to answer the original question of which one of the two groups was the first to invent the broader concept of using CRISPR-Cas9 for genetic manipulation. UC Berkeley decided to appeal the Patent Office's decision to the Federal Circuit, and that's how we ended up with the case we're discussing today. How did the Federal Circuit rule in the case, and what's the basis for its opinion? The Federal Circuit agreed with the Patent Office. The case turned entirely on the substantial evidence standard that the Federal Circuit must apply when reviewing the Patent Office's factual findings in these sorts of cases. And in the Federal Circuit's opinion, there was substantial evidence to support the Patent Office's conclusion that because of the differences between single-cell and multi-cell organisms, people working in the CRISPR field would not have had a reasonable expectation of success in using CRISPR-Cas9 to modify the genomes of multi-cell organisms based on Berkeley's disclosure of genetic manipulation in single-cell and test tube-based systems. What was some of the factual evidence the PTAB relied on for its decision, and why did the Federal Circuit feel that analysis was appropriate? In reaching its initial decision, the Patent Office noted that witnesses for both parties had testified that the function of CRISPR-Cas9 in multi-cell organisms was unpredictable and could not be determined without actual testing in those cells. For instance, Broad's witness identified several factors that distinguish multicellular organisms from single-celled organisms that could impact the ability of CRISPR-Cas9 to function in those cells, including their more complex and extensive genomes, the presence of nucleases that can degrade foreign molecules, and differences in temperature, ion concentrations, and pH, all of which could impact protein folding and function. Broad's witness also noted that scientists had experienced difficulties in transferring other genetic manipulation techniques from single-celled into multi-celled organisms. In response, Berkeley argued that none of these considerations turned out to be impediments to actually using CRISPR-Cas9 in human cells. But the Patent Office noted that the relevant question is whether someone working in the field would have expected there to be problems before the experiments were done, not whether the experiments turned out to be successful after they were tried. In addition, the Patent Office credited statements that had been made by one of Berkeley's experts and one of Berkeley's inventors at the time of their original publication that seemed to second-guess whether CRISPR-Cas9 could be adapted to work in other cells. The Patent Office noted that if the inventors themselves were uncertain, it stands to reason that others working in the field would have been even more uncertain. On appeal to the Federal Circuit, Berkeley argued that there was substantial evidence to support its arguments that those in the field would have had a reasonable expectation of success in using CRISPR-Cas9 to manipulate multicell organisms. But in response, the Federal Circuit noted that as an appellate body, it does not reweigh the evidence. Their job is to ask whether substantial evidence supported the findings that were made, not to ask whether substantial evidence supports fact findings that were not made by the Patent Office. And in this case, the expert testimony, the contemporaneous statements made by those working in the field, the statements by the Berkeley inventors themselves, and the previous prior art failures were sufficient for the Federal Circuit to conclude that the Patent Office's fact-finding was supported by substantial evidence. And finally, Amanda, what are some of the implications you expect to see as a result of the Federal Circuit's ruling? 
Well, it's important to note that the Federal Circuit expressly limited its decision to the question of whether the Berkeley claims and the Broad claims were patentably distinct. Their decision does not address the validity or patentability of either set of claims. So this leaves open the possibility for post-grant challenges to the party's patents through mechanisms such as re-examinations, IPRs or PGRs, and validity challenges in litigation. In addition, because the case was driven entirely by the standard of review, it serves as a good reminder to parties that when they are appealing from adverse decisions by the Patent Office, it's better to identify deficiencies in the Office's legal reasoning rather than finding errors in the Office's application of the facts to the law. But probably the biggest implication from the case is the fact that it halted the interference proceeding and kept the Patent Office from actually determining who invented the use of CRISPR-Cas9 for genetic manipulation. Prior to the decision, many biotech companies had been grappling with the decision of whether to take licenses from both Berkeley and the Broad Institute, or whether to roll the dice and bank on the possibility of only one group ending up with all of the patent rights. Unfortunately for many companies, the decision basically maintained the status quo in this regard. Berkeley could still end up with a patent on the use of CRISPR-Cas9 in any system, and we would end up with a situation in which Broad has a patent on green tennis balls, while Berkeley has a patent on all tennis balls, to use an analogy by one of the Berkeley inventors. And in that scenario, the two patents would exist side by side and be individually licensed and exploited. So biotech companies still face the possibility of having to take licenses from both parties. One possible consolation for companies is that since additional fundamental CRISPR patents have recently been issued to yet another party, the Vilnius University in Lithuania, we may end up seeing the creation of patent pools from which multi-party licenses can be obtained. And in fact, in 2017, the MPEG-LA group announced the creation of a global CRISPR-Cas9 patent pool, but we have yet to see if any of the major players will join. And finally, I'll end with the suggestion that this case may be the forerunner of the next generation of written description challenges that will percolate through the biotech industry. The Patent Office's analysis of this case might indicate that the Office was not convinced that the Berkeley inventors possessed the ability to use CRISPR-Cas9 in plant and animal cells when they applied for their patent. So similar to the antibody cases that currently lead the forefront in defining and honing our modern application of written description, it would seem the CRISPR battles that are appearing on the horizon may be the next wave of cases to further develop that mercurial area of law. Our guest has been Dr. Amanda Murphy, a partner at Finnegan, one of the largest IP law firms in the world. For more commentary on intellectual property news and issues, to listen to other podcasts, and to receive additional information on the firm, please visit www.finnegan.com. Thank you for listening to this podcast from Finnegan.